Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's uh, SpithyQ, SpithyQ.com. We're back with the next installment of the opening survey. Today we're going to be covering the Queen's Gambit Accepted. This is going to be slightly different from the uh, previous versions of the survey. I'm still going to go through some ideas and plans and what have you, but I'm going to do this more of a black perspective. I'm going to try and give you a very comprehensive, you know, 15 minutes or less black repertoire. Um, this is what I play. In fact, if I just uh, show you my uh, stats quickly, um, you can, this is my, um, my lie chest stats, so everything that isn't bullet, so at least blitz are faster. And you can see that my Queen's Gambit accepted number, like, it's one of my best performing openings is black. So, okay, it's online chess, but you know what? That, that, maybe that means something. And so I'm going to try and share um, that success I've had right here. And this is literally it. This is everything I know about the Queen's Gambit. There's not a lot. There's no extra secret theory. It just boils down to a couple really small ideas and then playing by opening principles. So first off, if we were to take a look you know, from 30,000 feet, what is the Queen's Gambit accepted all about? And we can best understand it by contrasting it with the Queen's Gambit declined. In the Queen's Gambit declined, Black is securing the center, He's trying to be very, very solid, not have any weaknesses. That's great. The downside is that some of his pieces, mainly that bishop, it kind of sucks. And play can be very stodgy. I do not enjoy these positions at all. I'd certainly much rather be white. And so the Queen's Gambit accepted, by contrast, is pretty much the exact opposite. Black is giving up the center. He's going to have one pawn to, um, to white's two. White's going to have more control in the center. He's going to have more influence there. On the plus side is that this bishop is very rarely bad. It has a very nice diagonal here. Also, black will often do something like this, and then this bishop on this diagonal is one of the best pieces on the board. And black's other pieces generally aren't too cramped either. And so we can see the trade-off here is that it's solid versus activity, right? Safe versus a bit more risky. And there is risk. Black is taking up some risk here because he's accepting a gambit. White generally gets a has some time, some control in the center, and it's very easy for black to go wrong. But if you follow a couple of my recommendations, hopefully that won't happen to you. And so now here, if I want to boil down this entire uh, video, the philosophy that I have into you know one section, here it is. So you're going to play d5, you're going to take the pawn, and now, moment of truth basically. If white does not stop us, our next move will be e5. If white does stop it, we're going to play c5. And that's basically it. That's the entire uh, Queen's Gambit accepted in a nutshell. That's 98%. Um, the rest is just, you know, some, some details. But, boom. So you're going to take the pawn. If white doesn't stop it, you play e5. And to highlight this, I'm going to show, it's not the most popular move, but it's very common, especially in uh, my Blitz games, is knight c3. Where white is evidently thinking about playing e4. Well, white did not stop e5, so we're going to play it, e5. And I just I want to highlight right now why this is such a good move. Is that there are a couple of immediate options that white has. The first one, the one that very rarely happens, is white could take the pawn. But this immediately leads to um, an endgame where white isn't better. Uh, he either has to displace his king so he can't castle. More often, he'll take with the knight. But after knight c6, you can see how easy it is for white to actually get into trouble. For instance, okay, I've actually seen a game where white continued with f4 here. I just played knight b4, and I'm actually threatening a fork here. It's surprisingly hard to stop, actually. If he tries to do something like king to d2, well, we're going to have bishop f5, we're going to castle, uh, c2 is falling, and it's only been seven moves, and white is in uh, a lot of difficulty here. Even if white plays a better move, like knight f3, well then, you know, bishop b4 check, he has to block, take, 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 we've actually won the e5 pawn. Now sure, he's going to win this pawn right back after something like this, right? But again, white is a bit tangled, black has absolutely no problems, and, you know, the better endgame player is going to win, which is fine, right? But, uh, there we go. So taking it gives white absolutely nothing. What about pushing? This is the most common move by far that I've seen 
in my practice. Well, we can see with knight f6. What's the most obvious move for white? Probably e4. And what's funny is that white has done nothing but obvious moves, right? Pushes the pawn, plays e4, look at this, he's controlling the center, he's fully developed, he wants to take this pawn back, everything is great, right? But after b5, white's actually um, in some difficulty. In fact, if you put this in the computer, um, Stockfish is going to say black isn't just better, black is quite better. What's the idea? Well, okay, so the pawn is defending this, okay. But if white tries to take it, we can just take on e4. And so we've traded a wing pawn for a center pawn. And after something like take, uh-oh, bishop b4 check, we actually control all of these squares. Oh shoot, white's actually in a bit of trouble here. We're going to castle next move. Uh, white either you're going to give up, ca white probably has to give up castling, or he's going to lose some material. We also have ideas like queen h4, bishop g4, maybe bishop comes to this diagonal. And the center's going to help, but white is in trouble. So really, white can't take that pawn. But if white doesn't take the pawn, we're threatening to play b4, and then knight takes e4 anyway. I actually had a game uh, against a, a blitz game, against a feeding master who played f3. I just continued with b4. He moved the knight. Take, take, queen h4, check. His king has to move. And we can see that he's in a host of difficulty. The computer says black is doing very well here. Almost winning. White can walk a tightrope. Almost winning. I, I ended up losing this game, unfortunately, because it's blitz and, uh, you know, time management. But you can see how uh, dangerous this can be for white. And that is even forced. You don't even have to take on e4. You can just continue developing. Do uh, bishop e7, castle, and let white try and figure stuff out. Uh, bishop a6, defending the pawn. White is in trouble. And this is perhaps the most powerful type of opening trap there is. Because white does nothing but natural moves, and he can get into a lot of trouble. Just by remembering this b5 idea. Um, this trap is probably one of the big reasons why I have such a good score in the Queen's Game Accepted. Because so many people walk into it, because it's so easy uh, to fall into, that is. Um, the best move for white, actually, is simply to play e3. And this is going to um, transpose into the e3 uh, variations. Uh, we'll see this uh, position later on. And so this is really, um, I, share, I share this to show the power of e5. Because white doesn't have a good way to punish this. Pushing doesn't work, taking doesn't work, and e3 just transposes into um, one of the main lines. Let's look at that right now, actually. So e3. This is uh, probably, used to be one of the more, I think it's the third most popular move now. This is actually my preferred way of playing. I don't play 1d4 a lot, but when I do the Queen's Gambit, this is normally how I do it. And I'm going to be honest, a big reason is because when I was a beginner, there were so many people, they, you know, I'm talking like a real beginner, they would play b5, trying to hang on to the pawn. And then after a4, c6, take, take, you've got this wonderful queen f3. If you've taken my opening course, you know about the weakness in the long diagonal. This is a perfect example. The rook is undefended, and it's going to be lost. Um, if you play any other move, for instance, if you play e4, after b5, uh, there's no more queen f3 trick because the pawn's in the way. Right? That, again, just for the record, you can still win the pawn back, of course. Right? Take, take. There's always this b3 idea. If black takes, you take that pawn, then we take that. So there's no way that black can actually hang on, force, hang on to the pawn. Uh, white can just uh, easily win it back. Uh, but rather than winning pawns, I've always liked winning rooks. So that's why I played e3. <laughs> but anyway, the exact same idea um, can go. If white doesn't stop us, we're going to play e5. White generally takes, take, take. Let's look at this position very quickly. What type of position is it? Well, if we look at from white's perspective, he has a uh, temporary lead in development because he has one piece developed. It is black to move. If we look at potential weaknesses, um, white has a structural weakness, he has the isolated pawn, and so, and black has no weaknesses. Yay! So that's a big point for, point for black. On the disadvantage, is this is not a normal isolated queen pawn position. Normally, black will have a pawn on the e-file, which he can then put on e6. And this is going to blunt some of the uh, 
you know, forced trauma that can be inflicted on F7. Here, the ephah is completely open, which means if black doesn't castle quickly, he could be in trouble, but it also means it's very easy for white to coordinate this. Imagine that was a better arrow. There we go. Attacks on F7. And so this is the most important thing you need to understand in this variation, is that F7 is very, very weak. Very weak. And so we want to prepare against that. And this is why I would recommend, um, in this position, is that we develop the knight before we, sorry, we develop the bishop before we develop the knight. For a rather simple reason. If we were to play knight f6, white has the option of playing queen b3, and again, f7 is in trouble. Now we can play queen e7, we're defending, everything's great, it's check, but our queen's in front of the bishop. Let's back up. Let's back up. Backing up. There we go. So instead, if we were to play bishop to d6 instead. You can imagine the exact same queen b3. We always have queen e7. Again, it's check. We're protecting it. But now our bishop's very happy. And every, everything is good. Um, you don't necessarily need to play bishop d6 the second. You could, you could play knight, knight c6 as well, immediately putting pressure here. And this actually is going to highlight one of the um, advantages so we talked about the disadvantage. There's no pawn on e6, which means that f7 is very weak, potentially, right? We have to be very careful of it. One of the advantages is that it also makes d5 much less threatening. In, if there's a pawn on e6 here, then d5 is threatening to open things up and is a very thematic um, break that white is trying to do. Here, there's nothing. We can just move the knight. It's in the center. The pawn is just in the way of the bishop, so it's simply stopping white from attacking. Our knight is nice and happy. Everything is good. Our pieces can easily develop around that pawn, so the pawn actually isn't really a hindrance. Uh, we're also attacking the bishop. That's always nice. And so there's, uh, there's no problems here. And so compared to other versions of the isolated queen's pawn, d5 is less forceful. That's always nice. And so... Um, that's basically it. You want to, we uh, generally play bishop d6 before we develop the knight. Um, I usually do it pretty quickly. We run a castle, and then our long-term goal is just pressure this pawn. That pawn is a weakness. Let's see if I can color it red. There we go. And so we're going to try and just trade pieces, not let white checkmate us on f7, and then we'll eventually win the endgame. Win a pawn, everything's great. One of the advantages of this opening is the longer the game goes on, in general, um, the better black tends to do. You know, if you don't lose in 25 moves, you're okay. Uh, if you do lose in 25 moves, that's obviously less ideal. But that's basically E3 in a nutshell. You're going to develop, uh, pressure the pawn, either try and blockade it or just win it, develop your pieces on normal squares, everything's great. Just slowly trade pieces. Don't have to do anything special. And that's what I like about this opening. You don't need to do anything special. We have two more variations to look at. We'll look at e4. This one's uh, a bit more uh, aggressive. But it's the same thing. If white does not stop us, e5. Um, I'll note here that, again, taking the pawn is not very good. We're going to enter the exact same endgame. Uh, pushing the pawn. We're going to play knight f6. The most common move, knight c3. But then we're in that trap again, or I guess... Um, this very poor variation for white. And so we can see how these ideas, they, they, um, they intermingle. They, they're all connected with each other, which it makes learning it a heck of a lot easier, right? Um, the best move for white is to play a gambit with knight f3, take, bishop takes c4. And we can see the potential of the danger, right? It's very similar to the last variation. We have no pawn on e6. f7 could be very uh, unfortunate for us, right? And white actually has two moves ahead in development. And now here's where sort of the second step of the philosophy of the Queen's Gambit accepted comes in, is that yes, we're taking a pawn on move two, but we're not obsessed with material. We're not trying to hang on to every single pawn like it's, a, uh, like it's our precious, right? Uh, and then we're gonna jump into a volcano after it just to hang on to that pawn. No, no, no. Uh, we grab the pawn and we make it hard for white to win it back, but we let white win it back. Our goal is to get a good position, not to get extra pawns. Very important. That comes to the heart of this. I'll have a couple of variations that show it. So um, generally you play knight c6, white's going to castle. And now the very, uh, the most important move, the move that I've always played, is bishop e6. 
Because what this is doing is this is immediately stopping the pressure on F7. Now, I agree, when you first look at it, isn't this, you know, take, take, our pawn structure is a little bit ru ruined? Yes and no. At the same time, we've got rid of his uh, terribly good bishop. We can play e5 at a certain point, and then our pawn, the extra pawn, is actually going to be locked down. That's pretty nice. Now, white could play something like queen b3, attacking both pawns. But you don't need to worry. You don't need to do something like queen c8 and try and curl yourself into a ball, because then things like knight f6 are going to come. And No, 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 no. Simple. Let white win the pawn back. We'll play queen d7. He can win the pawn. That's fine. We play rook b8, queen a6, and look what's happened. Material is equal. We still have the option of playing e5. Our knight is great. Our rook is on the open file. We can develop our pieces uh, anywhere. We can play either knight f6 or knight e7 to g6. To... We got... Things are great. Absolutely great. Because white, he wasted time winning his pawn back. He's moved his queen several times, and in that time, we've got a good position. How is white going to attack us here? He can't really attack us here. Things are great. I'm not trying to say that black is better in all these variations. Um, black is really only better in that one trap variation. Otherwise, it's an equal game. But that's fine, right? Equal game, better player's going to win. That's what we want. Another option here, instead of um, taking on uh, e6, is, you know, I could do something like this. That's okay. Let's just develop our bishop. And it's the same thing here. Um, we're perfectly fine letting white win his pawn back. For instance, after queen c7, we don't need to curl into a ball. I can just move the bishop. Sure, he can take. He wins the pawn. We're just going to play bishop d7. Where's the queen going to go? You know, we can chase it around a little bit if white desperately wants to draw. Maybe he moves it all the way back. That's fine. We're going to keep developing. I usually play knight e7 here just because... Whoops. Knight f6, e5, and then, you know, things can get a little bit hairy. But here, we're perfectly developed. Everything is fine. We might even be able to play c5 to win the pawn, but you know what? We don't have to. We can play this. We've got pressure. Again, we've got pressure. We've got an open file. We've conduced... Things are great. Things are fine. And that's really um, all I know about these variations. Is I'm going to play bishop b6. I don't care if white wins the pawn. I'm just going to put my pieces on squares and see what happens. Things are great. And I even have a... Uh, a pass pawn. Um, it could potentially a protected pass pawn if I can ever get uh, c5 fully in. And so again, the end game could very well favor black. We'll see. So let's back all the way up. And so those are all the e5 variations. Um, of course, the old classic main line. It might still be the main line. I'm not sure. I should probably check the theory someday. Is knight f3, and this is the only move that fully stops e5. The only move, right? So we can't play e5. So that means we're going to play c5. Um, normally, what I have done is I would just transpose into the mainline classical variation. So knight f6, e3, e6, take. And there is the c5. And this is a very mainline, which I probably should study more if I'm actually going to play it. <laughs> but the general idea is simply... Um, Again, we're going to get our pieces into the game. Normally, we do something along the lines of a6 and b5. Here, let me just put some of these moves on the board. Let's just, like, imagine move from white here. And let's see what's going to happen. The bishop comes here. Let's put the book on the board. There we go. The bishop is great. Uh, eventually, there's going to be an exchange on this square. So this bishop's going to be great. The knight can come to d7 or come to c6. We're going to castle. And you can see how, um, again, compared to the queen's gambit declined, in this main line or this main line-ish position, all of black queens... All of Black's pieces are on decent squares and are doing something. There's no obviously bad piece. Things are okay. Now, White, um, he's going to play... He can. White has a choice of either exchanging on c5 immediately, which tends to lead to, um, if I'm honest, somewhat dull games where White has this small nagging edge just because he has a slight lead in development, or White can play um, riskier um, and accept, allow Black to exchange, Getting an isolated pawn, which is a you know the classic normal isolated pawn. Um, let me just put that on the board actually. Uh, position sort of like this, where there is a pawn on e6, and that means if White does get d5 in, he's going to be opening the position up, and d5 is much more powerful. 
Um, so this is a move that Black must be continually on guard about. You cannot be laissez-faire and ignoring um, if white is building up on d5. And in fact, we can already see that white has um, three potential pieces that can jump in there. You can imagine, you know, combined with rook e1, our king still in the center, we could be in trouble. And so as black, you're constantly on the lookout uh, for d5. Constantly, constantly, constantly. Do not let white, um, you know, get this move in for free. Uh, but that's it. So that's what I've traditionally done. At the same time, it's very hard to do a very short, concise video about the entire Queen's Gambit accepted. And so an idea that I've been thinking about and exploring, and it looks like it works, is just playing c5 immediately. And this actually would work with our general philosophy. It's either e5 or c5 on move 3. Um, quite similar um, to previously is that if um, white takes, he gets that crappy endgame uh, for white, so that's uh, perfectly fine for us. It's very similar. If white pushes... Um, we're going to generally play knight f6. We can then play e6 to challenge it. Again, if white exchanges, then we're just going to get into one of those end games where white has absolutely nothing. Uh, can't really push the pawn. And after something like e4, we can imagine take, take. Let's put our bishop on d6. And again, our pieces can mostly play around this pawn. We can imagine this bishop can come here. We can imagine the knight coming here or here to put pressure on the pawn. We're going to castle quite quickly. We're going to castle much faster than white, actually. And things are fine. Very fine. Things are great. And so white probably has nothing better than just playing e3. Um, in which after something like knight f6, bishop takes you know e6, is going to transpose back into the... Um, classical Queen's Gambit uh, decline we were just looking at. And interesting, there might actually be um, a better move. Uh, for instance, we could simply take here, especially if you like endgames, because if he takes with the knight, we can just play e5, then we're going to exchange queens. We got the endgame, nice and simple. I don't need to know any theory about that. If he takes with the pawn, we immediately get that isolated queen's pawn uh, position. And so we have a very, very clear plan. So that's great. The one problem is that white might be able to play some type of gambit here. You know, we could uh, imagine that this could be very bad. You know, we could, well, actually, that's just going to lose a pawn immediately. And then, you know, so that position might be worth looking at a little bit. And so we need to, um, I've never actually played this. I've only looked at it. So I only have so much practical experience I can give. I really enjoy the normal Queen's Gambit accepted lines with e6, you know, e3, take, and c5. I'll probably keep playing them, but I'm pretty certain that this c5 idea um, works and leads to pretty simple games. And it leads to very, um, except for that one gambit. So that's just something we might uh, need to um, look at a bit more. Maybe I'll do a video on that. I don't know. But that, okay, so it wasn't quite 15 minutes. I lied. Uh... But in under 25 minutes, how about that, is this general introduction to the Queen's Gambit Accepted. And again, I'm not holding anything back. It's not as if there's these secret variations I have. Ha ha ha, only I know that no one else gets up. This is it. If you check, uh, if you really care, you could check my games on my chest, and you'll see that I'm following these recommendations. I just put my piece on these squares, and I see what happens. And that's it. And the beauty is that there, it isn't the Queen's Gambit decline. It's not a block position. It's about as open as the Queen's Gambit's going to get. About as open as um, one d4 openings, in all honesty, which is great. Um, the main downside to the Queen's Gambit accepted is that the London system and the call and all the other systems exist. And so um, you have to do some extra work against those, and you know they're really popular, especially... In amateur play so um, that'll actually be the next video is we'll explore um, the ideas for both sides about some of these systems and how maybe you can take advantage as both sides uh, we'll see anyway so that's that um, hopefully you found that interesting you know let me know comments criticisms if you know think I'm way off the board or you have a different way of playing again there are many different ways of playing for both sides especially for black but this is how I played it with some success so hopefully you guys have success with it not bad Okay, so um, that's it. Comments, criticisms, always welcome. Always welcome. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks for listening.
Bye for now.